Well, hi, uh, let's get started. Uh, we're not a huge group today, uh, so we can do this uh, somewhat informally, but I am uh, really delighted uh, to be able to introduce uh, Asim Prakash, uh, who is the Walker Family uh, uh, Professor of Political Science uh, at uh, the University of Washington. And Asim uh, has been you know, a leader uh, in the field of environmental politics for many years now. Uh, and so I just wanted to, to, I won't read you his full bio by any means, but I'll, I just wanna highlight some of his uh, accolades because they really speak to uh, the knowledge and the authority that he has uh, in this area. Uh, he's an elected fellow of the National Academy of Public Administration. Uh, he is uh, on the National Academies uh, of Science, Engineering and Medicine's Board of Environmental Change. Uh, and his recent awards uh, include uh, the ISA's Environmental Studies Section Distinguished Scholar Award from uh, 2023, so that was uh, quite recent. Um, then the APSA, uh, the, this is the American Political Science Association's Eleanor Ostrom Award from 2020, uh, which is the Career Achievement Award, uh, and that really is quite a, a distinguished award, especially named after uh, a Nobel laureate, um, Eleanor Ostrom, uh, who, who worked on climate change and other issues as well. Uh, and on top of that, the, the International Studies Association's 2019 Distinguished uh, International Political Economy Scholar. Uh, so uh, Asim has, you know, the, the full trophy case uh, of different academic awards. Uh, and uh, he's been an inspiration to a lot of people uh, over the years uh, working, uh, as I do, uh, on climate change and, and the sort of the intersection of political science and climate change. Uh, and so uh, we're honored to have him uh, today. Come on up, Asim. I'm going to turn the floor over to you uh, and then we'll um, we'll have a little bit of an opportunity for some Q&A when, when Asim's done. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Very nice to be here. As I was telling Jeff, this is one of the few universities I've never visited or presented at. It's lovely, and it's a lovely spring day. I didn't realize Providence downtown is very beautiful. Like the cost of architecture, everything. Oh, the architecture. I'm sorry? Yeah, the architecture. Beautiful, like right? so the walk across the river and all this. Having a wonderful time. So the, sorry, could you use the mic? Oh, sure, absolutely. Thank you. So what I'm presenting today is actually, I draw from a couple of papers. And uh, I just want to acknowledge my co-authors, Angus Dorsha, uh, Jana Foxy, and Lily Kinyon. Actually, Lily Kinyon, when she collaborated with us on a paper, was an undergrad. So it's part of the process. And Jana Foxy, uh, they are my doctoral students. So it's part of the process where you know, I have engaged with my students, undergrads and grads, in, in scholarly enterprises. So it's varieties of climate activism, assessing public support for mainstream and unorthodox climate action. So the big picture is something as follows. I think all, everybody in this room, I suspect, is worried about the state of climate policy. 1.5 degree is very difficult, almost impossible to achieve. And even two degrees target seems to be slipping away. So it's very frustrating for all of us who think climate crisis is happening and something needs to be done very quickly and authoritatively about it. And more so, the public is preoccupied, and there's nothing wrong with the public, with energy inflation and energy security. So these issues seem to be prevailing over the need to invest politically, economically in climate mitigation. So there is a high level of frustration and that gets manifested in a variety of ways. Of course, one would say, what about these net zero emission targets that have been announced by countries, by provinces, in the US context, we call it states, by firms. So this is obviously a positive development, but as you know, in a recent paper, we, we suggested that these targets are actually quite variable. There's a lot of greenwashing going on here. Of course, they vary on the E, the speed with which a particular unit seeks to become net zero, but what exactly is meant by net zero? So some of them are just policy announcements, not backed by legislative pledges, and the scope is very different. Sometimes they cover the whole economy, sometimes only a few sectors. So there's kind of a performative environmentalism going on, and before anybody makes a claim about being green, I think all of us, as scholars, as activists, as citizens, 
need to kind of step back and say, what exactly does this net zero mean? If you don't follow the monthly statistics from International Energy Agency, then you should. It's a very valuable source to track the patterns of energy. And the reality is that wind and solar are still a very small proportion of renewable energy. In fact, when we talk about renewable energy, the single most important factor is still hydro. So wind and solar are catching up, but wind and solar obviously have lots of problems, specifically intermittency. And that problem is not being cracked. Coal remains strong, at least in China and India, the top and the third largest emitters of greenhouse gas emissions. In the United States, coal has been kind of killed, for a lack of a better word, by natural gas, but the natural gas creates different kinds of problems. In fact, the recent focus on methane is just emblematic of how problematic natural gas could be. And to add to this, there is a huge spike in electricity demand. Uh, primarily because it is, uh, you know, we are going for massive electrification of the transportation sector. But the reality is that even data centers that are coming up are energy hogs. We had a meeting of Pacific Northwest Energy Council that does demand projections for the next couple of years. And there was a palpable gloom that the energy demand is skyrocketing and we simply don't have the renewable energy uh, up to be commissioned and to be interconnected to the grid. So essentially what the Pacific Northwest, which is blue, which is liberal, which is proclamate, is going to be building a spate of gas fired plants. And every gas fired plant is in economic life for about 40 to 50 years. So we are essentially doing investments in projects which are reasonably expensive. We're creating standard assets problems and we're creating political incentives for all these uh, investors to kind of resist any kind of economic transition. So there's a mismatch between our aspirations and the kind of renewable energy we have uh, to be pumped into the grid. So given this, I'm, I'm painting a bleak scenario, a bleak situation. So if you're a climate activist, which I am, yeah, I participated in demonstrations, do door to door, all those things. What should we do? Very frustrating. So we can persuade the lobby officials, change public perceptions, we can mobilize strike protest rallies, Friday for the future, you know, that was a very good example. We can litigate, litigation become very important, both in the US and outside. And it's also using tort and also invoking you know, outside common law. Like in the recent case in Switzerland, it was quite amazing. Our European Court of Human Rights uh, said that you know, it's a violation of human rights of elderly Swiss people. <clears throat> and of course, you know, we can mobilize. I we have a paper where we showed actually that members of the Congress that endorsed the Green Deal, New Green New Deal resolution on average had a 2% vote gain. So the argument that environmental issues don't have electoral currency, we don't find evidence in the United States. In some ways, I think all of us who think climate change is a serious issue, we should become electorally more aggressive, not run from it, but embrace it. Because there is actually an electoral payoff as our work suggests. What I'm really interested in today's conversation is what we call destructive tactics. And these occur in different ways. Oil pipelines, and import access pipelines, that's a very good example. Picketing of pipelines, picketing of airports, especially private airports. Uh, disruption of sporting events, such as Wimbledon. That, uh, two weeks ago, Broadway show was disrupted by climate protesters. Uh, that succession guy strong because of our directors. Cultural events like gay pride uh, events have been interrupted in London and other places. And of course, museum violence that is taking place. Of course, one can't say all climate activists are doing everything. There's considerable heterogeneity in any social movement, including climate movement. And they do different things. Sometimes they cooperate, sometimes they compete, sometimes they collaborate. So it's, it's a social movement system, social movement, and you know, one has to appreciate the heterogeneity. And climate issues are competing with other issues for policy savings, for policy agenda. 
So this whole climate conversation is taking place in a highly complex political situation uh, where there are different actors, even amongst the activist world, that are trying to find a foothold. And of course, then we get those exogenous shocks like Fukushima and Ukraine that kind of move the climate conversation to a completely new level. Like after Ukraine, suddenly energy security became very important. And whether it's President Biden, who I think is a very pro climate president, even he had to backtrack and do a lot of things to you know, kind of encourage uh, energy exploration. There was even a talk of suspending the federal gas tax, which makes no sense for the world. So before, you know, I kind of present some of the empirical work on public support for disruptive action, I think theoretically, probably let's step back and see what is the theory of change? Why do people do what they do? Assuming the things are not right now. So what I submit is there are at least five ways with some overlaps to think about climate policy and how is climate policy being made. And then try to put climate activism in this kind of framework. So model one is a very typical IPCC kind of model, what we call the information deficit model. And the idea is that climate change is a scientific problem. You need to create more knowledge, more data. You have to share it and eventually science will prove it. Because it's a technocratic problem. And it is true that you know, we need empirical basis for kind of changing the economy of the last 150 years. But this approach has certain problems. So first is when we share data and we are trying to be individually honest, we sometimes try to project gloom, negative news. The world is going to happen, and by 2050, this is going to happen. And obviously, you know, those are the headlines, that's not what the report is. But this is how the media sometimes tends to portray these scientific reports, which causes climate anxiety, especially in your generation, and it leads to a sense of helplessness. That we really can't do anything because this train cannot be stopped. Alongside, there is an issue of what we call over attribution. Climate change is a very serious problem, but not every social problem or political problem is because of climate change. And the classic debate is the debate of the Syrian civil war. There was there were many people who blamed it on climate change. And then there was a huge pushback from the academic community, Jan Selby and others, saying, no, actually, that's not true. This is an over-attribution problem. The same debate is happening in Western forest fires. So media is very quick to blame it on climate change, and climate change obviously has a very important contribution. But there are several other factors that are happening, that are taking place, to make these forest fires, including people living inside the territory, uh, et cetera, et cetera. There's several other factors. Same with flooding. Whether it's in India or Pakistan, yeah, floods are terrible. And with climate change, there are going to be extreme weather events. But part of the problem is that the governments are not enforcing zoning laws. People are constructing houses on flood plains where they should not be constructed. And the existing ponds, the watersheds, have been kind of taken over by others. So over-attribution is a serious problem, and as scholars and as activists, we have to be very careful not to over-attribute, because that creates an opportunity for climate critics to say, you people are telling lies, or you people are exaggerated. Then, of course, is the issue of motivated reasoning. In a typical rational choice school of thought, if people lack information, you give them more information, they will revise their preferences and do the right thing. So people are information-seeking, because people want to be you know, informed. But psychologists say that that's actually not true. There's a large number of people who seek information that kind of satisfies their biases, satisfies their priors. So they're motivated reasoners. So that's why we have the echo chamber effect. The liberals flock towards MSBC, the conservative to walk Fox News, and this kind of reinforces their beliefs. It re reduces cognitive dissonance and cognitive strain. So the scientific model really doesn't work when increase in a time of increased polarization and a higher level of motivated reason. And of course, trust in science gets eroded sometimes because of unfair attacks by Western interests. So I'm not saying fossil fuel industry is not being a mischief maker. It has been a very, very important mischief maker. Even research shows that. But the reality is that 
Overall, if I answer the data, it really worries me as an academic that we see the trust in science is getting eroded, some more than others. So if the basis is scientific, then we have a problem. The second is the moral problem. The climate change is a moral problem. It started with a discussion about intergenerational equity, that this is a perfect moral storm. And now we talk about morality even in terms of intergenerational equity. And there are appeals by moral leaders, Pope Francis, the Dalai Lama, that are urging people to reduce consumption. So there is a degrowth movement, there's so many other movements which are saying this is a problem of overconsumption. I mean, to do something about it. And I'm pretty favorable to that perspective. And I, I understand the logic of it. But some of the work we've done, it shows that moral appeals are not working, especially when it comes to vegetarianism and so on and so forth. And in a time when there is massive poverty and inequality, the degrowth message is difficult for the public to understand. Because degrowth would involve massive redistribution. Otherwise, inequality and poverty problems are going to get accentuated. So that's why we really don't see many people really taking a political stand on degrowth in academia, yes, but not in the public sphere, and certainly not in India and China. I'm from India, I'm you know, pretty connected to India. Nobody talks about degrowth. In fact, the, India is going through elections and everything's about growth. It is quite amazing how the different conversation is between India and China. Then there is the school of technological optimists. That is the technological problem, we can fix it. We can fix it in terms of creating new sources of renewable energy, new ways to dispose of waste, and there are you know, lots and lots of new technologies in play. Hydrogen hubs, geoengineering, deep sea mining, carbon capture, carbon storage, nuclear reactors in the modular form, you name it, it's there. Even fusion is now up in the game. And I'm sympathetic to technology. After all, electric vehicles is a technology. And I think technology does play an important role. But putting all the eggs in the technological basket, I think it's, it's problematic. First of all, there's a potential for moral hazard problem. That if we can ca capture carbon and store, why mitigate? Let's continue with the party. And you know, we just suck carbon out and store it somewhere. So that is one big problem, and that's why all in natural gas is really going to about carbon capture and storage. And all of us have to be very careful about that. And second, when the government starts you know, picking winners and losers in large-scale technological push, it creates rent-seeking problem. So you know, now we have Biden, and you know, Biden is pretty pro-climate. But God forbid if 2024 somebody else gets elected, do we want industry policy to be led by that administration? So my thinking is always suggest a policy assuming the person you don't favor will be in power. So it's kind of you know, minimizing risk. And I don't think this kind of massive governmental intervention for technological change is devoid or is without problems. I think there are huge, huge problems. That doesn't mean we should not invest in technology, we should, but we have to be careful about the downside. And then, of course, uh, for economists, it's a question of market failure. And if you get the prices right, you have carbon pricing, you have market reforms, the results would follow. I think it's a very innocent perspective because they really don't understand politics. Because carbon pricing means raising the cost of energy. That is no, no. Whether you are a farmer in Netherlands, France, Germany, Prague, wherever, or in the US, carbon pricing is facing a lot of political problems. It's unfortunate because there is a social cost to carbon, but this is the political world we live in. And we have to you know, enact public policy, climate policy in the political sphere. So then the issue is why not have an approach adopted in the Inflation Reduction Act? Don't price subsidies. And that's one way to kind of diffuse new technologies. So IRA, I think, was a very smart idea, given the political constraints in which the United States operate. But there's a limit to subsidies. Governments all over the world are running huge budgetary deficits. The United States can get away with it. We are piling up a trillion dollars every year. 
not my generation, but your generation will suffer. Because as a sum of the, at some time, at some point in time, we are going to reach that tipping point where there will be a massive increase in interest rates because we have just too much of debt. So one way to think is what we call debt by GDP ratio. Most countries have below 100 percent. The United States is already at 120 percent, and this is just the governmental debt. If you add individual credit card debt, we are a very very indebted nation. So economic Interventions through subsidies, I think, have huge, huge problems, especially when it comes to budget subsidies. So the fifth perspective, the perspective I find most interesting and persuasive, is climate change is essentially now a political problem. I think we have sufficient information, we have sufficient knowledge of uh, how to go about it, but what is lacking is a political will to actually make it happen. And root cause, not only cause, is the unequal distribution of benefits and costs. Something on which Jeff has talked about. Jeff has written. So this is a very important insight piece for me that we have to get the politics right, the sociology right of climate change. And the political problem is accentuated because it is a low policy salience issue. When you put together the other issues, if you look at the latest few polls, they ask people about the top 20 problems that the Congress and the new president should focus on. Climate change, I think, ranked 18th or 19th. It was the bottom of the list. It was so depressing. So a lot of times these opinion polls are misleading because they are only talking about climate change, but that's not how politics works. Climate change is competing with space with other issues. So it should always be in the context of inflation, immigration, crime, healthcare, so on and so forth. Second is the power of fossil fuel and private exposed sectors. So we have two major scholars who have this debate. They've been having a party for the 150 years, and people with power never give up power. So first it was climate denial, now it's alternative technology, etc., etc. So they are a big impeding factors, but there's something more to that. That's why I like the phrase that Jeff and others call the climate exposed sectors. So it's not really the capital that's it's the coal miners, it's the teamsters, or think of the United Auto Workers Strikes, that they clearly targeted electric vehicles. So sectors that would see their competitiveness diminished because of rising energy costs, because of ban on fossil fuels, have incentives to focus. So we have to come up with a system of just transition or whatever you want to call it. To assuage at least some of the actors that feel that climate change costs are being offloaded on them, the books are being balanced on the back, and of course then there's a rural backlash. A recent paper of us that we published: one fourth of U.S. counties, every fourth U.S. county now has enacted ordinances restricting renewable energy. Every fourth, and this backlash is occurring across the world. Whether it's England, Norway, Denmark, France, you name it. And the interesting thing, that what we find is, liberal counties are more likely to enact these ordinances than conservative counties. If you control for income, like countries or counties, 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 counties. Right. Yeah. Replication rate is also very strong. So there's a massive, massive rural backlash, and if you add transmission lines, wow. so we have about 1250 gigawatt of installed capacity in the U.S. We have another 22 to 2300 waiting to be what we call interconnected. That means you have a utility, you have to put the high voltage line on the grid. It is taking on an average three years to get interconnection on an average. In fact, John Podesta, who was until recently the advisor to Biden, said that we, we, we had become so good at stopping things that we forgot how to build them. Because Governor Newsom of California is very, very frustrated. Every time you want to transmission line, there's a lawsuit. Environmental review is one so So all these processes have been kind of weaponized in what would one call new reason. People love tra transmission lines as long as it's not in their back. So public benefits, private costs, people don't know to wear private costs. And of course, opposition to higher energy costs. So in the state of Washington, we, in 2016 and 2018, tried to enact carbon tax through a referendum. We failed both times. 
And then the governor went through the legislature and we enacted what is called the Climate Commitment Act, CCA. It's cap and trade. It's generating lots of money. And, you know, state is investing in mitigation projects and this and that. But now, a, lot of, a bunch of people have filed for a referendum and the referendum is going to happen in November. And if passed is any indication, because both 2016, 2018, we lost by about 53, uh, 43 to 57. It was a huge, huge margin. Climate Commitment Act might get overturned. It's an extreme nervousness. And adding to the nervousness of the high cost of gas, state of Washington has the third highest cost of gas at the pump in the country. And governor is saying, oh, the high cost of gas is not because of Climate Commitment Act. And, you know, we tried to impress on his advisor that this is actually the wrong strategy. You should say, yeah, it is because of that, but look, the money you've generated and this is how your life is improving. Because you can't run away from it, because Republicans have pinned that on you. The more you try to deny it, the more guilty you feel. And, and you, you know. But high energy costs, this is a big problem across the world. So what do you do if you're a climate activist? Essentially, the frustration is so high, people want to shake up the status quo. Because what is happening is unacceptable. And do something which has shock value that increases issue salience, and people say, oh my God, we have to do something. Because there's a de facto climate emergency. The more we keep this thing down the lane, down the road, the worse it will become. So there is a school of thought that says violence, how to blow up a pipeline. I personally don't think it's a good idea at all. Because it would involve, it would invite counter repression. And it's already happening. 17 US states have already enacted what is called the critical infrastructure laws. This crackdown happening in UK, public order, law, France, and Germany. So I think property violence is not a winning strategy. Apart from the practicality of it, how many pipelines can really grow? So one tactic that really emerged very prominent in the last two years is what we call museum matters. And the theory of change is that it has a shock value if you kind of, you know, throw soup at the Mona Lisa or something, people say, oh my God, wow. Of course, it's covered by glass, Mona Lisa is not damaged. So the intention is not to damage. So one has to be, you know, very careful. It's not vandalism in that sense, but nevertheless, it has a shock value because, you know, this was almost sacred. You kind of violating the secular sacred, for lack of a better word. But the theory of change, the way I think, is that the idea is to raise the issue salience and make people talk and just give a sense of frustration that uh, at least a section of people have about the state of climate policy. And then of course, you know, what sociologists call the radical flank effect. If some radical groups do radical things, then it you know, policymakers will be more amenable to talk to the more moderate functions. So there'll be some policy progress. Good cop, bad cop. So good cop, bad cop is, you know, it has worked in the past. So why not try it now? So in 2022, we counted that there were 38 incidences. Essentially three countries accounting for two thirds. UK, Italy, Germany. That probably these countries are the most museums. So I would have thought France should also be in the list. But this is what it was. <laughs> and most of the incidents took place between May and December, peaking around the COP in Egypt. So it was carefully timed, it was choreographed, it was on social media. And essentially, it's three groups that's the generation, just stop oil, that are, everything is available. Uh, it's a sort of open source, all the data is available. And all these are part of 822 network. So essentially what we saw in 2022, and we are updating the data set for 2023, that this is predominantly European phenomenon. Interestingly, legacy NGOs like Greenpeace that are known for radical action did not participate. So these are very climate focused newer NGOs. So this kind of a division of labor taking place between the climate social movement. 
And all these were very carefully choreographed. In fact, it was more of a social movement phenomenon, a uh, social media phenomenon than the actual changes. So the issue is that if you think about the theory of change, that increasing issue salience will lead to policy action. Is this really positive attention that will kind of motivate policy action? Or this is creating a kind of a backlash that, oh my God, these people are spoiled to rich kids. They're brats. And you know, they just don't get after them. This is the kind of statements you know, some people have made. The German Chancellor called them nuts. It's a nutty job. The very colorful statements from public officials. And most importantly for us as scholars, is, does it have public support? Because if it has public support, then I'm less worried about what policymakers are saying or what the Association of Museum Directors is saying. Because if <laughs> public says, wow, this makes sense, then politicians are sensible enough to revise their opinion. So this is what we are very interested in. So we did an online conjoint experiment in United Kingdom, UK. Uh, which is one of the three countries where most of these incidents are happening. And it's not in Museum Vandalism, it is the Wimbledon, it is the Snooker Tournament, it is the Flower Show, it is Gay Pride, the whole range of activities that the activists have sought to disrupt. And I'll go through the logic of a conjoint in a moment. We essentially asked people would they be willing to give 25 pounds, that's the monthly average donation in the United States for charities, for a charity with specific characteristics? And uh, the key variable of interest that we are very interested in are disruptive tactics, traffic stoppages, because they're also stopping trains and motorways, what we call highways here, motorways, museum protests, sporting event disruptions and author of tactics like lobbying, research, education, and education. So this is what, are you people familiar with the conjoint? Okay. No. Okay. Okay. So, when we do a survey experiment, we are able to manipulate one variable across state countries. And in conjoint, the beauty is that you can ask the respondents to look at several attributes at the same time when coming at an assessment. Conjoints are very popular in election studies because when people are voting for elections, they're looking at multiple attributes of candidates. So one reason it has gained popularity with people like me, people who do climate stuff is that when we ask people to support climate change or a climate organization, they are looking at different things that these organizations do. And the way the conjoint works is that if you're a respondent, you are asked to compare two organizations and then you're given a list of attributes, and these attributes are randomized. And every attribute has different levels. So organization age, 0 to 5, 5 to 10, 10 to 15, 15 plus. So some people might be more trusting of older organizations. They're not fly by night operators. A percentage of women on board. So the climate conversation is taking place in the context of the Me Too movement. And there's a huge, huge effort in lots of countries to mandate that certain you know, portion of board membership is held by women. So percentage of women on board. And environmental organizations are being criticized for being too white and too you know, male-centric. They don't have sufficient number of non-white people on their boards, and they don't have sufficient number of women on the board. So essentially, we created, based on our exhaustive literature survey and talking with people in the field, that these are the seven characteristics that take different values that people might consider when they think about giving to a climate organization, a climate charity. And the primary variable we are very inter interested in is the advocacy tactic. And we use the word primary is because organizations typically do lots of things. It's not that organizations just do one thing. So we wanted to focus that this is the main thing they do. So essentially, and I'll decode this, we are trying to understand that in a given attribute at a different level. Does it make people more favorable towards the environmental organization or less favorable? This is essentially what our marginal mean is. While averaging out over every other factor. It's a very 
very intuitive way to understand whether this particular attribute and that level of that attribute is allowing us to understand the approach. And if you see, so marginal means mean we'll have a marginal means for museum and art gallery protest, a separate marginal means for sporting event protest. Or if you say percentage of funds going directly to programs as opposed to overheads, we'll have marginal means for every single banner. So we can get a pretty good sense of what people are, what factors are motivating people or demotivating. So before I show you the graphs, let me verbalize the findings. Much to our surprise, so this is one of those research papers you get a results, and he said this cannot be true. Let's look at the data again. Let's rerun the numbers because across all demographics, all subgroups, when we talked about destructive tactics, there was a diverse support, even amongst young people, even amongst people who would vote for green parties, or people who favor higher petrol tax, who would ban, who would uh, favor banning all exploitation. They were not favorably disposed towards this destructive tactic. So this was at least to us shocking, because the intuition was, and maybe I'm getting too old, that I thought the younger generation is different. The younger mm -hmm. generation likes to have some fun, and you know nothing is sacred now, and maybe you know they'll favor traffic stoppages and who gives a damn to Google? But anyway, who plays tennis these days, right? People just shocked. Wow. Second, this result even held for people who support climate action. That means individuals are separating climate objectives from climate tactics. I may be a climate person, favor aggressive climate goals, but I may not favor the tactics to achieve those goals. So when we talk about radical tactics, they're different from radical objectives. And I think that's a very important lesson, at least that we need from the study. And there's increased support for organizations that rely on citizen donations. People don't want charities in market organizations to be beholden to big corporations or to the government. Grassroots, that's exactly what the promise of civil societies is grassroots. So that was very encouraging. Organizations that have low overheads, which is a important finding in the nonprofit literature. In fact, the whole charity navigator model is based on low overheads. Because there have been a lot of scandals in charities. They, you know, uh, not lots, there have been a couple of scandals that charities are misusing funds and money is not going for the intended beneficiaries. They're supported by volunteers which again, I thought was very encouraging because that's what civil society is, volunteers. And finally, women on the board. So people see the connection between gender equality and climate change. And they're more favorably disposed towards organizations that have a higher share of women on their boards. So this, I thought, these were encouraging and also very much in line with our expectations. So I have several graphs, let me, so this is the overall sample. So we have a point estimate and we have a confidence band. Essentially marginal means, if you have this perpendicular end 0.5, if you are on the left side, that means diminished, right side, enhanced, if you crisscross, it's not statistically significant. So the pattern we are seeing is the primary advocacy tactics, traffic stoppages, sporting events, museum, our art gallery protests all are on the left side. Very clear. And what we call the orthodox tactics, it's on the right hand side. And if you go through different attributes, so organization size is a wash, age of the organization is a wash, weekly volunteers only, you know, becomes important when the volunteers are very small. So people penalize organizations, but the percentage of women on the board, it's very clear that you know, people want a higher share of women on the board. Same with revenue from citizens, citizen support. It's very clear what people are telling us, at least in their are. So the results are very interesting, and I would say very revealing, that this is what individuals would like climate organizations to go. So what about subgroups, or what we call heterogeneous treatment effect? 
political party. We should probably just mindful of the one one o'clock ten time. We should probably just have like three four minutes. Okay, so let me see this. You know, one would say if you support a ban on oil and gas exploration, you are a pro climate person, and these also people who agree with the ban do not support disruptive tactics or climate beliefs. Very clear. People don't like disruptive tactics. Or people who are willing to incur private costs that pay a higher price of petrol, which means gas, don't want disruptive tactics. So at least this suggests that individuals, even the ones that favor strong climate action, do not support disruptive tactics. So, what are the concluding thoughts? You know, one point five is someone has slipped away. Now the battle is to remaining within the two. And if the current climate lethargy continues, what should and what could <coughs> climate activists do? That's a question for all of us. Number two, it is very intriguing why are legacy groups like Greenpeace that are known for radical action that that have made a name for radical action. Why are they not participating in disruptive action? So is there an informal division of labor, or they they can read the tea leaves and they say, well, this doesn't have a way out, so let's stay away from it. So we don't know. And I think you know, deep case studies can be really helpful. Try to understand what was your thinking on this. We have not tested for radical flank effect. That means, okay, I would not like to give to this NGO which is indulging in disruption. But might I want to give to a more moderate NGO? So that's we are actually exploring a, a follow-up paper to test the radical flag effect. Similarly, what is the support for disruptive action in other countries? Is it a very UK thing? Because UK is very polarized. If you think America is polarized, this is the UK. You feel good about yourself. UK is very very polarized. So maybe go to you know a continental country and see what's happening. And finally, test for disruptive action in other issue areas. This is climate idiosyncratic, and do we find this public, uh, not opposition, but lack of public support for disruptive action, also in other issue areas? So these are some of the papers we are exploring at different stages, and I welcome your thoughts. Floor is open uh, for questions. Mike here. Kick things off. Awesome. Thanks so much, Asim. This was great. I'm really looking forward to going through all those graphs with you later today. Um, uh, but one of the things I just wanted to touch on overall is, you know, when we're talking about marginal means, right? We're actually talking about the lack of relative support compared to these other categories, right? Where it's the marginal mean averaged across all those choices, and so. You know, when we haven't fixed reference category, we're kind of like it's people are going to be more likely to give money to the thing doing education versus the thing doing, you know, the group doing disruption. So it's, I think some of those claims that, you know, I'm, I'm not sure like how far we can take that they don't support disruptive tactics outrightly. The other question I have or kind of question around that, that's more of a comment, but um, is if the tactics are really trying to increase issue salience, like do they care? Like, is that what's important? And it, it, this connects right to testing the radical flank effect, which you're, you're not doing here, and I understand. But is that really the goal? And thinking back like to historical cases, unfortunately, we can't go back and administer you know, a robust conjoint survey experiment in 1967. But you know, other you know, tactics in terms of Vietnam War protests, which at least in terms of press coverage, seem to have been very radically opposed, but you know, changed the change the frame. And so I'm just thinking that, you know, the concluding thoughts here, like how would people at Just Stop Oil think about that? They might not be so troubled. You want me to first take the question and then answer? That's or? a trick question. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> As you wish, but why do you take that? So, the, the, the results are also the mind. Mike, sorry. Yeah, yeah, thanks. The results also hold if you do ACME, so I don't think the results really change. What's the reference category for? So I think the, the difference is that ACME is very sensitive to reference category. Marginal means are not. 
that's the beauty of virtual meetings. And that's why I think a lot of people who do conjoins, I don't do so many conjoins, but you know, I've been dabbling for a while. We find marginal means to be more persuasive. Uh, but this is a very important methodological point. In fact, a lot of the ACME results uh, are suspect because it's also sensitive to the level. So it's not only the attribute, but also the level. And when it comes to heterogeneous treatment effects, ACMEs run into problems. So I think that's an excellent point that uh, to what extent it's sensitive to reference category is not. That's the beauty of marginal means. The second question is. So that's the question, you know, I have debated with, you know, different set of colleagues who are involved in this project, different projects. And you're right that, you know, one of the problems with these experiments is you can't do it retrospectively. But we do have lots of other social movements. You know, we have Black Lives Matter, we have Me Too. Uh, in a lot of developing countries, new movements are taking place. And I would even say we have climate counter movements. So here we are trying to test it in liberal movements. But what about counter movements? Is there more support for disruptive tactics by counter movement? Because people say, oh, these people are anyway violent. So let them give them a pass. I don't know. But you are right, you know, in terms of generalizability, to what extent this can be generalized over space and over time, or over issue areas in it. And that is, I think, the, the next. Uh, the next challenge for us to try to understand the scope conditions for our work. Absolutely. Other thoughts? Um, this was really interesting. Thank you so much. Um, I did have a bit of a question because I was like not so surprised that the findings on like museum vandalism and like those findings would decrease support but there has been like a huge number of movements particularly in North America where like you know taking up public space on rail lines or street corners or like those sorts of public protests where they're like covering bridges and like those but often tied to like issues of sovereignty so like lots of these for the Dakota Access Pipeline um, in Canada there's a big fight about uh, the TC Energy Pipeline in BC and people blocked rail lines in Ontario and Quebec um, and that actually like vastly raised public interest in the issue that originally was like quite regionally confined. So I guess I'm curious if you think these findings would change if they were tied to other areas, because in both of those cases, like it was tied to issues of indigenous sovereignty and therefore like people seemed much more willing to entertain more, more radical forms of action. But I'm really postulating based on anecdotal evidence. Oh, no, You've no, looked no. into this. Like, that's do a, you think it would be Oh, yeah, that's a brilliant insight. You're absolutely right. So people are contextualizing the support based on the question we have asked. So if you phrase this question about indigenous sovereignty, violation of indigenous sovereignty, or picketing outside private airports, because that's now become quite popular then probably people will favor disruption because it is the cost of disruption being imposed on others. Because here the cost of disruption, like traffic stoppages or motorways or you know, London trains, that really irritated people. In fact, motorists got out of their cars and assaulted some of the climate activists and so on and so forth. So it is when people are bearing the costs themselves. Similarly, if you have bought a ticket for a famous museum and suddenly this climate activist turns up, you're very angry because you waited for such a long time. But when the issue is really about people who've been wronged historically, like native people, and we are talking about non-violent disruption, not violent disruption, then we may get different results. I think you're absolutely right. This is something worth uh, worth exploring. In fact, we are doing a couple of papers on critical minerals mining, and a lot of these critical minerals are in native lands or they are in BLM land, which is of historical, cultural, and religious importance for Native people. And part of it is that people would go and kind of change themselves and so on and so forth. So this is something worth exploring, that to what extent context shapes support for disruption. Excellent point. Other questions? I have one if nobody else has one, but I'm happy to turn it away if others do. Uh, all right. Uh, 
obvious, I'll take the mic down, but I think we have like a uh, streaming audience in the millions on YouTube, but nonetheless, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll put a hold to form here. Um, so the question I have is really is about um, maybe the, the potential, how much you worry about the gap between what people say in a survey versus what they actually do in terms of behavioral preferences. Uh, and um, it's, it, I think it's, this is one of those areas where it's just very hard to tease out uh, sort of a cl conflicting set of information. Uh, and so I'd, I'd love to sort of have you reflect on, um, uh, on exactly that, because I, I, just from a personal uh, perspective, I remember seeing some of those, you know, soup cans against the, the you know, Van Gogh uh, paintings and thinking, oh gosh, this is like completely not what I stand for, even though I'm very, very pro-climate. Uh, and then having that second moment of, of realization of like, but I wonder whether it works, you know, I, I did have that sort of second thought about just in terms of, um, you know, raising awareness around the whole issue. So um, love your thoughts. Mm -hmm. So there are two, two dimensions to your question, and both excellent ones. One is to what extent surveys actually reflect behavior. And that's a perennial question. That we have this huge survey industries, ever since Gallup started it, what, almost 100 years ago. And to what extent they are actually reflective of behavior. And I'm, I'm not expert on electoral surveys, so I'll not venture there, but what I've tried to read up on that. And it seems that at least when one is looking at trends, as opposed to one short survey, they can be quite illustrative. And having talked to a lot of posters, especially in India, because I kind of keep in touch with Indian politics. Politicians take polls very seriously, very, very seriously, because they think it reveals a lot. Of course, you know, by the time the poll is done and the election takes place, there's always that time. But politicians, in my previous job, I actually have an MBA, I worked in Procter & Gamble in marketing, and I did a lot of market surveys. Market surveys were taken very, very seriously in terms of demand predictions. Of course, you appropriately calibrate it. If 60% of the people are saying they're willing to purchase, in reality, it will amount to 30%. So you have the appropriate discount. But that's why I'm not talking about the point estimate, I'm talking about trends. That this is the broader story we are hearing from the British respondents. Uh, whether people will actually give the money, so one could, I'd love to do a field experiment, it's just more expensive. So we can give, you know, people have given tokens and say, okay, how do you allocate this money between these organizations? It would be interesting just to sort of see how these 12 organizations or so that you, you uh, mentioned, uh, you know, you can't do this yet, but like a year from now, like how did, how did they fare? Like how did their revenues go up or down? I mean, even without doing a survey, you could just look at the, sort of the raw facts of like, you know, did they prosper or not as organizations? That's an excellent, excellent idea. Uh, I looked about charity data available for England. I think it is, but that could really be tracked. Absolutely. Um, Seems that's great, really interesting. And um, uh, I think this is one of the hottest topics right now. People are trying to figure this out and we're finally getting some research. So just this morning on the important news site of Twitter or X, Somebody, I think it was Stephen Lewandowski had a, a new survey showing that people are much more approving of attacks on museums if they are if they receive fossil fuel funding, um, and that uh, and that even crossed party lines. It was a, an interesting survey because it had Republicans and Democrats separated in the U.S. So anyway, just just that I think we're starting to get some more on this, um, but. Uh, I do, I'm sympathetic to this big question of, you know, do we really know what the impact of the actions are? It seems like we are all speculating um, that we really don't have evidence on, on policy change or enduring social change, normative change and stuff like that. Anyway, this is big, this is tough stuff for social scientists. But what I'm thinking about is your dependent variable is willingness to donate 25 pounds. And as a social movement, you know, taking a social movement perspective in sociology, it may be more important for these groups. Are you willing to give your life? Are you willing to get arrested? Are you willing to step up and, you know, risk your job, your family, or whatever else you have 
to to join this movement because movements need activists and people, especially that is indeed these very young groups. Um, just to say that sort of the cycle of social movement organizations at the beginning have very different needs than these you know established groups, which are much more worried about offending donors and foundations and so on. So anyway, just a few thoughts. That's actually a very good solution. solution. So you're talking about shadow commitment versus deep commitment. Yeah. And so a different set of uh, dependent variables, variables yeah. have the same conjoint, change the dependent variable and see to what extent the deepness of the commitment changes how people respond. Um, because that's and you don't need that many people to give their lives, you know, or to give up a lot. To... Getting arrested is important. Uh, people have done survey about are you willing to turn up in the in the town hall to talk about this, this and that. So everything, you know, there's more higher commitment of time. But I think I, I think it's a very good idea and can be easily done. So what is the what is your theoretical prior that as the level of commitment increases, support for disruption will increase or decrease? What's the theory behind it? Well, mostly I'm saying that just uh, social movements have their own needs and that uh, you, a, f a few very committed people can make a movement, can make a strong organization. Uh, so maybe it's, you, we're going to see, we are going to, and this is one thing that Dana Fisher at, uh, uh, she, AU, yeah. at AU now, American University, um, says is that this disrupt, as people get more and more desperate or more, um, it just seems like we're heading in, you know, in the wrong direction that they, we will see more and more disruptive tactics and they're going to keep evolving and uh, I think that that's indisputable. Yeah, no, I, I buy that. But what I'm saying is, what is the theory behind changing the dependent variable? Why would we expect the results to change? What, what's your theory behind that? So if suppose we say, instead of donation, would you be willing to get arrested? You think people will support disruption more or disruption less? No. <clears throat> Because this is very shallow commitment. It's just writing a check. And still we find people have distaste for disruption. And in England, they are fining people, jailing people for, you know, public order bill. So would people be more hesitant to disrupt or less hesitant to disrupt? What's your sense? We are unfortunately at time. Okay. Uh, and so we you. should probably carry that on uh, uh, over dinner uh, or, or wherever. Uh, but thank you uh, all. Uh, and most especially, please join me in taking uh, a seat for, for this great talk. Thank you.